So you missed all this stuff about my goddaughter, but she's wonderful. The second piece of this is that words in our faith matter. Thank you for your patience. The words that Christ said to his disciples and that we inherit as disciples today matter. It matters that Jesus Christ didn't just say, let it go. But Jesus Christ said, forgive 70 times 7. It matters that Jesus Christ didn't just say, be charitable or charity is a virtue. Jesus said, sell all that you have and give to the poor. It matters that Jesus didn't just say, noble are the meek or kind of impressive are the merciful or way to go, peacemakers. Jesus said, noble, noble, noble. He also said, blessed, blessed, blessed. So there you go. The mic wasn't my only mess up. That'll be it. Mess up number two. Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek and the merciful and the peacemakers. It matters that Jesus didn't just say, affirm your God and tolerate your neighbor. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with, with all your mind and with all your strength and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These aren't just important instructions. Jesus says, these are the commandments. There are no other commandments greater than these. Words matter in Christianity. And they don't just matter in speaking about what we are to do, how we are to live, but it is also speaking to who we are at our core, in our being. God didn't just create the world and didn't just create us and say, look, that's passable. Created the world, created us, and called us good. When Jesus Christ came down as God incarnate, he ignited a theology that would go beyond him and be illuminated by Paul and elucidated by the writers of the Gospels and the Epistles. And it would be picked up by Christian thinkers and writers and people in pews for hundreds and hundreds of years. Those Christian words matter. Even the ones that are elusive, like creation and sustaining and providence and judgment and sin and grace, and the ones that are so very deep and close to our heart, love, hope, peace, and joy. So if we say that words have much weight, importance in Christianity, then this text that Sam read from Luke is vital. Now, here again the first four verses. I hope you're not disappointed that I can't address all 13. That would be a very hefty text. More to come. The first four verses are what become familiar in the Lord's Prayer. So here again, the first four verses. He, Jesus, was praying in a certain place. And after he had had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive all those indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. When we read this and look at the context of the gospel, prayer is not unfamiliar in the gospel of Luke. Prayer is a rhythm in Luke that that isn't just instructed to the disciples, it isn't just instructed to us, it's practiced by Christ as well, again and again. Just a few examples. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus prays at his baptism, prays on a day after working miracles, prays before choosing the 12 disciples, prays before Paul's, I'm sorry, Peter's confession on the Mount of the Transfiguration, on the Mount of Olives, and of course, painfully, praise from the cross. 
When the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray, and Christ returns with, when you pray, say, we aren't just hearing a demand for the disciples, a demand for the early church, or a demand for us. It's not just to be distant. When we pray, we are joining Christ at Christ's side, being with Jesus. The New Testament scholar Matthew Skinner explained the Lord's Prayer in this Gospel of Luke, these four brief verses, as depth in simplicity. In those four verses, we are talking about this reverence and also need. We pray reverence. Right off the bat, we acknowledge God as Father, caretaker, creator, parent, the one who knows us intimately, the one who knows the fullness of children. We acknowledge right after that, hallowed be your name. That is, God, you are the one worthy of our praise, our worship, our song, our joyful noise. We acknowledge your kingdom come. That is, change the ways of this wicked world, transform it into what you intend for us. Our societies, our lives, lead us gently home. We pray reverence and we pray need. Need is at the heart of the human condition. We all need. We are all driven by need. We pray need. And in this prayer we pray, give us our daily bread. Bread. Simple. It means sustenance. And it also means when we are full, when we are not hungry, we are dignified. We pray need when we say, forgive our sins, release us from grace, release us from self-loathing, release us from shame. Give us this day a new start. We pray need when we say, do not bring us to the time of trial. And what we are saying there is not only help us in this preservation of our bodies, but help our preservation of faith. Now here's a thought as to why living the faithful life doesn't mean living the faithful life alone. Jesus Christ teaches the disciples how to pray particular words. And generations of disciples following generations of us, you, me, or mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children, churches, pray these same words together. Because as different as we are, the different stories that we bring in our individual lives still flow into the one story that is the good news of the gospel. Let us pray. And together, let us say amen. That's not the end. I know amen usually ends the sermon. Uh, uh, the next amen will be the end. <laughs> Words matter. I tried to uh, think of an illustration in my own life, and here it is. The most important piece of the Lord's Prayer to me is your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Let it be your way. Let us understand or at least turn toward mystery beyond mystery. Let us turn toward your love, O oh God, beyond all human understanding. Your way, not ours. Words matter. An example of words that matter in my life, cat chair, yellow. That sounds nonsensical. <laughs> Here is the explanation. And necessary autobiographical fact here is this, one that I don't share often, one that I don't especially like talking about, certainly one that I don't talk about a lot from the pulpit. But a necessary autobiographical fact to make my point is that I am epileptic. I am epileptic. And so in understanding these words, cat, chair, yellow, what those words are, are the words that my neurologist would come into his office and say to me while I was trying to sit there patiently. Jonah, I need you to remember these three words. Cat, chair, yellow. Now what that was was a test. 
Just like when he made me walk across the floor, toe to heel, toe to heel, just like when they ran the sharp objects across my hands to make sure those nerves were A-OK. -okay. He would give me those words, and we'd run then through diagnosis, through how the medications are working, and he would work on his computer, then he would leave me to kind of read my book while he wandered and visited patients for a very, very long time, or so it seemed, and then he finally returns to me and said, Jonah, what were the three words? And sometimes I get it right. Cat, chair, yellow. Words matter. Those words framed my life for years. They frame it still in some way. The utterance of those words was pointing out that I had a new understanding of myself, that I was not the way I wanted to be, but here I was the way I am that the path is kind of mixed up as it was of the life that I had was no longer going to be the path that I walked down. That knowing those words, cat, chair, yellow, meant that sitting in the neurology waiting rooms, I'd be able to look around at those around me and think, gosh, I hope my case isn't as bad as theirs. It meant that when I was there, I would feel those confessional terms in my life that we talk about in a prayer of confession when we talk about separateness, shortcoming brokenness. Those were no longer just words of my spirit or my soul. Those were words of my body. But flip it, when I got them right. When I got those words right. When I was able to say back to him, cat, chair, yellow, when I wasn't silent as this thing got just a little bit better, there was also another reality that set in. This wasn't the course I desired, it isn't now the course I desire, but there's still hope in it. My most foolish of friends, and they are foolish, God bless them, became the most adamant caretakers. My parents, who fought their own way through this with anxiety and fear, no matter what, walked me through the deepest and the darkest valleys. Somehow I think that those words, when I spoke them correctly, somehow, Jonah, you will find in this life a triumph. Somehow, Jonah, you will find that brokenness can still bring you fullness. I think something like that is at the center of the Lord's Prayer. And I think something like that is at the center of every prayer that we lift up to God, that we lift up to Jesus Christ, and that we lift up to the Holy Spirit. This is what we're saying. Hear God, Christ, Spirit. Here is the reality of where I am. And here is where I hand my life to you and pray. Mystery beyond mystery. Love be all understanding. Please redeem us still. And sometimes it becomes, wow. So says our faith, dear friends, pray frequently, faithfully, lovingly, recklessly. Pray together and pray without ceasing. And this is the Amen.